For the News and Observer, I'm Don Vaughn, Capitol Bureau Chief and host of Under the Dome, and you're listening to our latest episode for the week of January 15th, 2024. Today, as you're listening on Monday, is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a holiday remembering the late civil rights leader, and of course, a day off for a lot of government workers uh, and public and private sector. So today, I'm joined by our Washington, D.C. correspondent, Daniel Battaglia, and we're going to talk about what's going on with congressional primary races, what Congress is doing right now to mess with the gridlock in an extra way, even more than usual. Uh, later, we'll talk about endorsements at the state level and in Congress and money. And anyway, before we get to all that, we will talk about what the feds are doing now, Danielle. So, um in dc where i guess the government is still working is it going to be shut down by the time people are listening that's questionable um so we came back into session on tuesday i believe it's been a weird week um and we have until next friday to fund the government which i feel like anytime you hear me talk is all i say anymore because we keep doing continuing resolutions to fund the government what they did in the very infamous meltdown in October, November, when uh, Representative Patrick McHenry of North Carolina became House Speaker, was they split our government funding into two batches. So there's four pieces that need to be funded by next Friday. And then the rest of, it's like a 12, it's a very complicated process up here, but basically 12 pieces of funding. The other half will be in on February 2nd. And so it seemed like on Sunday we had this very lovely kumbaya of Democrats and Republicans agreeing on what our funding was going to look like. They had this deal made and it was on the table. And once again, as you guys constantly hear me say, the Freedom Caucus came in and said, we're not happy with this agreement. Come back to the table. And we're seeing the same steps that they took in October of blocking the rule, which is basically what allows legislation to move on to the House floor. So Thursday, I believe it was Thursday, no, it was Wednesday, they had to go home without accomplishing any work. They didn't know what they were going to do. They've allowed some legislation to move since then, yesterday and, well, Thursday and Friday. And uh, we're coming in Monday, they're off, it's a federal holiday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they've got to get this done. And right now it looks like we probably will not come to an agreement. The Senate is trying to do what they can do to get something moving, but we're not sure that the House will agree to that. And uh, there has been speculation about whether this will become another McCarthy ousting where will Johnson keep his job? We don't know. And snow is coming Tuesday, too? Snow is coming Tuesday. It will be the first time in, like, I think they said 725 days we've had more than an inch of snow in D.C. Okay, so maybe that'll make all all is calm, like, type of vibe there. If you all heard with the uh, recording a second ago and sounded like traffic, if uh, those of you watching the video version of this, I'm in the newsroom uh, in downtown Raleigh, Fanano, and... And Daniel, of course, our DC correspondent is up there calling in. So I'm sitting next to the window, and that's what uh, you might hear occasional occasional traffic going by. Usually. So this, uh, or the you're near the airport, so yeah. different kind of uh, different kind of traffic up, up there. So this is just kind of what things are going to be now, right? For a while, it just seems how Congress's dysfunction is just going to continue. It feels that way. I mean, we are down to um, such a slim majority. And right now we have um, Steve Scalise. He's a representative in the House. He is out um, getting a stem cell transplant. So that has dropped the Republicans from only being able to lose two votes. And so there is a lot of power for the Freedom Caucus to be able to come in and say, like, we don't want to do this. We're not going to give you the votes. They can vote with Democrats and, and make you know, basically blow up whatever the Republicans are trying to do that they don't agree on. Um, so when you have this slim of a majority, a lot can go wrong. And it's really interesting to watch this because you wouldn't think it would go this way, but they're holding more power than they should be able to hold. 
So you'd think that people wouldn't want to join that gridlock, but they do. And they're running for office and we're less than two months out from the primary, a little over a month from, from when early voting starts and in North Carolina. So really North Carolina's congressional delegation changed a lot this this past election and it's gonna change pretty significantly ag again, right? Yeah, right now we have, um, and I love covering it this way, it's a seven, seven split. So we've got seven Republicans and seven Democrats. The map was changed drastically. Um, so it looks like it will be a 10-3 split with one district that could go either way. And that's Don Davis's district um, in the far northeast side of the state. Um, we've had Representative Patrick McHenry in the 10th district, Representative, uh, my list is so long, Patrick, it's Patrick McHenry. And then you've got um, Wiley Nickel, Jeff Jackson, and Kathy Manning all saying we're not running again for re-election. And so uh, we're losing a huge chunk of our delegation and that has left room for a lot of people to jump into the race and, and run. So what? who is this gonna favor, do you think, by the end of the election? I mean, probably Republicans, I guess, right? I mean, no it, matter what. It, I mean, it's set up for Republicans to take over the delegation. That That's a that's an obvious look ahead and, and how the legislature set it up. Um, so we will see more Republicans serving on our delegation. Uh, I think the NRCC, which is the National Republican Congressional Committee, is expecting to pick up a lot of um, Republican congressional seats nationwide, and they're counting on that to get a larger majority going forward. And so um, I think they're hoping for a red wave. If they get that, do you think because so many of them will be freshmen, is it going to lower North Carolina's profile in a sense, I guess? I mean, obviously, the House Speaker and the legislature here, you know, Tim Moore is running for Congress. So, he's, of course, he's North Carolina famous, you know, but that's a lot different at the federal level. McHenry was North Carolina famous and then became nationally famous, you know, through the series of events. So is it kind of a... a to be determined or are there some things that, you know, when you're new, you're just not going to have influence yet or, or what? It's a, I think it's a grab bag, but losing Patrick McHenry, he's got 20 years experience. That is a huge loss for North Carolina. Um, he, I mean, he's the chair of the finance committee, which is a huge position to have for a North Carolina congressman. He was interim house speaker, which cannot, you know, be ignored because he basically was making history by setting up what that position means and entails for the future of our country. And so to lose him is, uh, I will say too, he also had bipartisan support. So people from both sides loved Patrick McHenry, wanted to work with him. Um, he's a huge loss. Wiley Nickel, Jeff Jackson, they're both freshmen. And so, you know, trading a freshman for a freshman, it's kind of the same thing. Um, I believe Kathy Manning served two terms. It might be three, uh, but she doesn't have the highest profile. So that's about where it lands. Maybe a wash. So we're, uh, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, influence and the form of endorsements and money and how that plays out at the congressional level and then the state level too. And then, uh, of course, stay to the end for our picks for headliner of the week. We'll be right back. You're listening to Under the Dome. I'm Capitol Bureau Chief Don Vaughn here with Danielle Battaglia, our DC correspondent. And before the break, we are talking about Congress, the gridlock that seems to be never ending, and that the people still want to go there and be part of it. Um, but before that, they have to win the election. Before that, they have to get through their their primary. So money's at play. Endorsements are at play. What are you seeing with these congressional primaries and how that uh, influence will have maybe any impact on primary voters? Do they do they care about endorsements and and what factor is money in all this too? The endorsements are fascinating me right now. We've been talking a lot about them. Um, we've seen a couple come out this week, GOPAC, which is usually for legislative um, races, came out and endorsed Gray Mills, who's running in the 10th district to succeed Patrick McHenry. And then um, they also 
endorse Speaker Moore, who's running in the 14th district to succeed Jeff Jackson. They both got an endorsement from GOPAC. Um, American for Prosperity came out for uh, Gray Mills' opponent, Pat Harrigan. And you also have the Trump endorsement for Addison McDowell. It's really interesting to watch the GOP races this time around because the GOP is so fractioned right now that it used to be that you would see these endorsements come out and know that the Republican Party was supporting them. But like American for Prosperity isn't for Trump, but sometimes they're endorsing Trump candidates. Club for Growth, which is a huge money, they move a lot of money in North Carolina and support candidates like Ted Budd. Ted Budd's always um, been given money his entire political career from Club for Growth. Um, they no longer get a, get along with Donald Trump. And so like watching these movements play out and watching them endorse Trump candidates, but not support Trump, it's like the layers of how these endorsements are going to play out this year has been super confusing to watch. And what they mean to the voter is super confusing. Do you think they're just kind of, it's like the last election, or, I mean, nationally, that, you know, Trump obviously lost and a lot of uh, with the midterms, you know, Trump uh, or MAGA wing candidates lost, but then some won. Yeah, so I guess the, the strategists, the operatives are thinking like, well, if we say we don't want Trump, then what about that race where, you know, he actually had a hand in, in winning? And obviously in North Carolina with the the Republican primary for governor, Mark Robinson, Trump hasn't didn't use the word endorsement yet, but he, you know, praised Mark Robinson. He had him at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. And that's it's just a matter of time. You know, I assume Trump will probably come down here at some point and you know make his official endorsement then. So maybe it carries weight if somebody is already a likely Mark Robinson primary voter, but other candidates no. I mean, it was very helpful to Ted Budd. It raised Ted Budd's profile in the Senate race in 2022. Um, and that was coupled with Club for Growth, which again is confusing because Trump and Club for Growth no longer get along. Uh, but without that, Ted Budd probably would not have been the nominee and gotten where he got. Um, so obviously Trump's name helps and and he did carry North Carolina in 2020. Um, but it will be interesting to see how it plays out when he is a candidate again in 2024. And there's so many legal issues going on with him and a lot of drama to see how that plays with voters this year. Right. And when before, um, you know, State Speaker Moore announced that he was going to run for Congress and was lining up all his ducks, you know, he endorsed Trump, obviously mm -hmm. hoping to get that because of wanting that group of, of voters. And it's you know, you're sort of seeing testing out, is that going to get you more votes from people? There's plenty of never Trumpers in the Republican Party and a lot more even in the past year, a couple of years. And it seems like there no one really knows what's going to happen once you are voting and no one knows how you vote. Right. Yeah. So then they'll be like, oh, wait, no, we do like him or no, we don't like him and whatever will get you to win, I guess. Right. Yeah, it's been it's been quite the journey to follow. It's uh, I am fascinated by 2024 and what it will all mean. So speaking of 2024 and the primary, we've had um, some big endorsements lately at the state level this past week, Scenic, which is the State Employees Association of North Carolina. It's not a union. North Carolina is a ban on collective bargaining by public sector workers, but they do advocate for state employees, uh, mainly at the legislature, wanting them to get raises and benefits and that sort of thing. And Scenic endorsed State Treasurer Dale Falwell, who really has like more of a direct impact on, on their daily lives because of his role. But it still carries a lot of weight because there are tens of thousands of state employees and those that are Republican primary voters. You know, in North Carolina, you don't have to be a Republican to vote in the primary. You can, if you're unaffiliated, you can you can vote, you just pick whichever partisan ballot and the largest voting group here is unaffiliated, followed by Democrats and then Republicans. But that might end up carrying weight with primary voters that they would prefer that full will go on to the, the general because they know of what he's done, that they you know support that he's looked out for state employees in the past because there's a pretty big vacancy rate with state employees and maybe they're not seeing that same type of support 
from from Robinson as lieutenant governor or Bill Graham, the attorney and and businessman that's that's running. So we'll see if if Scenic has has weight there. And then the other endorsement is a local endorsement, but for statewide races, the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People is an influential pack in Durham. It can turn a lot in like Durham is very blue, so it uh, can influence election all the packs within within the city of Durham. But it also is you know overall messaging, and they chose um, it was all Democratic primary, and they chose Stein over Mike Morgan, who's African American candidate retired from the state Supreme Court, and Attorney General Josh Stein is white, and Morgan and Stein and others spoke to the Durham committee and the event I covered around the holidays. It wasn't their official pitch and interview, but it was basically the room full of the um, influential already, you know, in office or like the former mayor Bill Bell was there, that sort of thing to try to to make their case and. What the committee pack chair told me at the time is, you know, it's the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, wh- whichever, you know, works, uh, the candidate is most beneficial to, to the priorities of the black community. And that isn't necessarily a black candidate. Sometimes it's a white candidate, but also that they want that person to win in the general. So that could have had a hand in Stein because he has been running, you know, I guess Morgan got in in September right when he left the bench. And Stein's been in officially a year and has all kinds of money, um, endorsements. I mean, the money is a big factor because of it buys the advertising, you know, everything else, like the the signage, the like all of it is is connected to that and gets your your name out there a lot more. So that was a surprise that they picked Stein over Morgan, not as much because of. Um, I, I just I was thrown off a little bit by that. And then Rachel Hunt, the lieutenant governor, she's white. The other candidate, Ben Clark, former state senator, um, is black. They went with Hunt probably for a similar reason of being ahead in, in the general. And then Satana D. Berry, who's the Durham district attorney. She is um, she's African-American, the white Democratic candidate or of the you know front runners is Jeff Jackson, as you mentioned, from Congress. But. Um, we are running out of time, so I'm going to scoot on quickly to our picks for headliner of the week. Danielle, who or what is your headliner? I'm going to go with the funeral of Sergeant Nix this week. He is a Greensboro police officer and um, died tragically on December 30th in an officer-involved shooting. He was off duty. Um, I've worked with Greensboro Police Department for I don't know, like five, six years and knew him and the people around him very well. And watching them uh, lay him to rest was just heartbreaking to watch yesterday. So they're all in my thoughts and prayers this week and um, wishing them well as they try to pick up the pieces from losing a really uh, good officer. A serious and and tragic headliner, um, of course, worth a mention. And my headliner is also uh, pretty serious this week. Of course, it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and he had a, a you know generations lasting um, influence on on America. The um, he's a monument in in Washington D.C. The uh, we're leading a couple weeks into Black History Month this past year. North Carolina Freedom Park opened up downtown across from the Legislative Building um, between the Executive Mansion that has a lot of um, quotes from. Black North Carolinians just about about freedom. And as I've mentioned on these before, the African American monument on the Capitol grounds uh, here in Raleigh is is stalled. So maybe that'll happen eventually one day. Um, all right, well, we're we're out of time. Um, Don Vaughn for Danielle Battaglia. Thanks for listening. And uh, maybe you'll get some snow up there and talk about uh, talk about that next time. So probably no snow here though. Oh. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks.